we're going to start with a little exercise. I would like everybody to raise their hands over their head, and then without looking at them, point your fingers at each other and touch them together. <laughs> you can adjust a little bit. All right, great job, everyone. You can put your hands down. All right, so the sense of touch is an inherent part of our lives. When you did this task, you don't really think about how you do it, how you move in space. When you move your arms up, you feel forces in your muscles, you feel the stretch of your skin, maybe a little air under your armpits, all of which come together to tell you how high your arm is. But that alone wasn't perfect to get it into just the right spot. When you moved around, you eventually made some contact where you felt that skin-to-skin -skin contact and you knew that you had touched something. All of this information together comprises our sense of haptics, our sense of touch, and I'll be talking about the sense and the technology that's related to it. And because haptics is often so underappreciated, I'd like you to imagine for a little bit what it's like to lose your sense of touch. Now we have other senses up here. Sight, you could imagine what it would be like to lose your sense of sight, at least for a little while, by covering your eyes. You could do the same thing with hearing. Smell and taste, maybe a little bit more difficult, but what would it be like to live without the sense of touch? We have some inklings of this from our own experience. So for example, if you're out in the cold and you're trying to zip up your jacket or button your coat, this can be challenging because you lose some of your mechanoreceptors embedded in your skin that tell you when contact has occurred. And you might fumble and feel awkward. And it's not because your muscles are cold, but it's more because you've lost your sense of touch. Now, Dr. Shinoi mentioned prosthetics. And prosthesis users also have a profound loss of sense of touch because they've lost their limb. And currently, we can't replace that with artificial sense of touch. You can also imagine that uh, if you have a particular disease, like sensory neuropathy, which often happens for people with diabetes, they also can lose sense of touch on their body. But you also experience some loss of the sense of touch in your own daily lives when you use impoverished user interfaces, when you type on your computer or you play with your iPad or your smartphone, it sees you like this, an eye, a pair of ears, one finger, maybe two if it's multi-touch. But your interaction is more on the touch side of creating inputs to the device. You touch it, but it doesn't touch you back. And the science and technology of haptics is about creating an interface where you can really interact in a more profound way with those kinds of devices. Now, the basics behind how this technology works is that you record a user's movements. You see how they behave. And they could do this, for example, by holding on to a little robotic device. And then that device records the motions and can transmit that to the movement of, say, a cursor in a virtual environment. Now, if I was a haptic programmer and I was writing code in this virtual environment, I could say that if I touch this teapot, then the user should feel a force from the teapot. And therefore, I'm going to program my device to have motors that push back on the user so you can feel what's going on in that virtual environment. But it's not just about virtual worlds. It's also about controlling remote devices. So you can replace that virtual world with a robot, and you can teleoperate it. So the user moves, the remote robot follows their motions, and then the user will feel what that remote robot is feeling. Now, not all haptic devices look like this. This is not the only scenario. For example, this is a research project from my lab where the user wears armbands, which are equipped with motion sensors, as well as cameras that also sense the user's motions. And then we provide vibration feedback in different locations in the body that helps guide a person how to move, maybe to do a yoga pose, maybe to rehabilitate a stroke patient. And so these haptic devices can take many forms. Let's talk first about how these devices could be used in teleoperation. For example, robots in space. We have demining robots. They're used by police and military personnel to keep people away from harm's way when they have to decommission an explosive ordnance. And then there's also my great interest, which is surgical robotics. How do we get deep inside the body of the patient without having to cut big holes in them? 
And the important thing about all of these examples of robotics is that they're not autonomous robots. They're not like self-driving cars. They're teleoperated. It's important because of the dangerousness and the complexity of these tasks that there be a human in the loop. But the human can do a better job if they get the sense of touch feedback. So to give you some more examples of teleoperated surgical robots, this is a video showing a current commercially available clinical system, the Da Vinci surgical robot, which is helping surgeons do procedures less invasively, more accurately, and more precisely inside the body. But it's extremely challenging to give the user a sense of telepresence, as if they're not manipulating through some mechanism, but rather you'd like them to feel as if they were directly contacting the patient. So we work on technology that addresses this. One example here is in suturing. Now, I wish I had a haptic device that I could hand to each one of you so that you could feel this directly. Uh, but as a replacement, there are little circles that change color in the with haptics video, depending on how much force is being applied to the user. And you can see that with haptics, the surgeon can tie the suture with just the right amount of force so that it doesn't come undone, but it doesn't break. But without that sense of touch, it's very easy to actually break the suture because it's difficult to tell just using visual information how much force you're applying. Now, you can also use this in scenarios where you can't see much at all. So if you are looking for a tumor that's deep inside the liver or maybe the kidney and you would like to palpate it to find that hard lump, this is something that you can do with force feedback or touch feedback as well. So here you have a bar graph that changes height and color depending on how much force is being applied. But giving forces, that is these forces that push back on the arms as well as little color bars uh, isn't the only way to do it. So we try to come up with other clever techniques to fool the user into feeling something that isn't really there. So here's an example. If you were to tap on a surface with a stylus, like a pen, you feel gross forces in your arms that push you back, but you also feel a little bit of stretch in your skin. And that is another important cue that tells you that you've touched something. And so we've designed devices that just stretch the skin a little bit at the fingertips that give you a cue that you've touched something without having to have a large device that applies forces back to you. So here's an example video of someone using one of these devices. It's a skin stretch device. The fingers actually aren't on the skin stretch uh, red dot, which is actually pushing on the skin so you can see it moving. But the idea is that when the user moves around, they can control a remote device or a virtual object, and then they can get this skin stretch feedback. And it turns out that a little bit of feedback can do a lot. In fact, it can be almost as good as having a full force feedback experience. So, apologize for a slightly bloody picture, but we're talking about surgery here, so let's be realistic. We can use robotics and haptics to improve surgery, but we would also like to improve the surgeon. And surgical simulation and training is another great area for haptics. So people are designing devices to mimic the environment in which people do surgery. So you can take real minimally invasive surgical tools, like the one shown here, and replace them with artificial tools, which are attached to motors on the end, that apply force to the hands so that you can experience doing surgery in a virtual environment. Because after all, everybody uh, has, someone has to be the first patient of a new surgeon, right? And wouldn't you rather that person be a virtual person? It could be practiced on in one of these types of environments. And yet, this is still very limited. Uh, we can do laparoscopic surgery because we're holding on to long, thin instruments, and we can put motors at the bottom of them. But the holy grail of haptics is actually to do something that's more fully interactive, that's something beyond this kind of impoverished user interface. And so one of the holy grails of haptics is that you could create a kind of digital clay where you could take a surface and you could change its mechanical properties as well as its shapes. So here's a design in my lab, which uses a combination of silicone rubber and coffee grounds and air, both vacuum and pressurized air, in order to change the different feel and shape of a virtual surface. And so by designing devices like that, we reimagine what it means to be a haptic interface. Can we change the way that things feel so that when you reach out and touch them with as many fingers as you want, that you experience something realistic? 
And the hope with this device is it could be used in medical training for teaching people how to find lumps and differentiate things like tumors and cysts because they feel and shape slightly differently. All right, so medical simulation is a kind of educational haptics. We're interested in other kinds of education as well because it turns out haptics and movement and the sense of touch are really directly connected to learning in the brain. And there are a lot of people who are haptic learners. Some of you may be visual learners or auditory learners, and there are many people that like to learn by touching things. And we have great experience with outreach programs. We have K-12 students come into our lab and touch devices. And one of the things I love about the video I'm playing now is that the kids are practically crawling all over each other trying to get their hands on the devices that we're showing. And these demos are really fun. Except because the sense of touch and these devices are so personal and uh, limited in their size, it's really only one person that can interact with a device at once. So we're looking at how we can expand our reach with haptic devices. In particular, we want to use them in education, not just for the sake of showing technology or even teaching people about the technology itself, but a haptic virtual environment could actually teach someone intuitively about physics or math or other concepts that they might not be able to get just by seeing equations. So if we can translate those equations into something that people can feel and intuitively learn, we can enhance the learning of lots of people who like to learn through their sense of touch. And so we're doing this at Stanford. We're trying to do it in a big way. Uh, this fall, for the first time, I'll be teaching an online haptics course where we're going to distribute small haptic hardware kits made as low cost as possible that people can assemble in their own houses using their own tools and connect to their own computers through very low cost electronics. And the idea behind these sorts of devices is that we'd like to get these into the hands of as many, as people, as many people as possible. And it's not just about us teaching them but we want to learn from the population of people that will use them. If we get haptics into the hands of makers, into the hands of people that are creative and innovative, and maybe aren't coming from the same perspectives as me and my graduate students, there's the great potential to be able for us to learn from them and crowdsource haptic design. So I want to conclude by thinking a little bit about how wonderful the human sense of touch is. As my students and researchers in my lab are so gamely demonstrating, there are so many compelling haptic interactions that we have with the world around us, both inanimate objects as well as people. And we're not that close yet to being able to recreate all of these kinds of sense of touch in these sorts of interactions. But I'm not sure that we ever want to get to a perfect virtual world. We would like to be able to experience emotion and touch with people from afar. But in my own life, when I hold my toddler's hand or stroke my daughter's cheek, I would like to know that I'm there physically and that we have that connection. That's something I never want replaced with linkages and motors. And all of this research that we do in technology has only served to me to impress upon the amazing emotion and personality of the human sense of touch. Thank you.